Why did Yevgeny Prigozhin stop his force of 8,500 Wagner mercenaries just as we were within 120 miles of Moscow? What was his true intentions? Was it a coup d'etat, armed rebellion, or something else entirely? Prigozhin's origins give us some hints into what he truly wanted. He grew up poor in St. Petersburg in the 1960s. He was in and out of prison from the age of 18 until he was 30 years old. Once he was released, he set up a successful chain of hot dog stands in St. Petersburg. Prigozhin used that money to open up expensive high-class restaurants in the city during the 1990s. At the same time, Vladimir Putin had recently quit the intelligence service to start a career in politics. He took a liking to one of Prigozhin's restaurants called New Island. This is where the two likely met and hit it off. And once Putin became president, he started showering his new buddy Prigozhin with military contracts worth $1 billion to cater the Russian military. Prigozhin was now a rich man with connections in very high places. But he still lacked two things, power and unconditional respect. Reports from those who know Prigozhin personally say he's largely driven by the love of the game, the thrill of the chase. Money was never his main concern. According to those close to him, from his perspective, he's battling corrupt Russian elites on behalf of the common man. In the mid-2000s, Prigozhin saw an avenue to earn the power and respect he desired. His head of security, Dmitry Ukin, was a Russian Special Forces veteran who used his military connections to start the Wagner Mercenary Group in 2014. Prigozhin likely connected Ukin's mercenaries with Russia's President Putin. This got them access to priority security contracts around the world. Prigozhin came to be known as this mysterious, behind-the-scenes, unofficial, unconfirmed co-founder of the organization. However, that would change on February 24th, 2022, when Russia invaded Ukraine, and it thrust him into the spotlight. In September 2022, Prigozhin recorded a video and released it publicly of him recruiting tens of thousands of murderers and convicts from Russia's worst prisons, promising if they joined his storm units for a six-month contract, they would then be set free if they survived. These prisoners would inflate the ranks of Wagner forces from an estimated 10,000 up to 50,000 soldiers. That same month, he claimed to the press that he was indeed the founder of the Wagner Group. He proved to be very talented in public relations after being the shadows for decades. Prigozhin traveled to the Donbass to personally oversee the Wagner mercenaries' progress in photo ops. He was frequently seen on the front lines wearing military fatigues. These Wagner mercenaries became instrumental in the Russian capture of Bakhmut, which had become the focus of their war effort. Putin had become overly dependent on Prigozhin and his fiercely loyal private military company. This was a vulnerability for him. This gave Prigozhin the power to criticize the Russian government and regular military without fear of reprisal. On the 1st of October, 2022, after the Ukrainian first counteroffensive retook large sections of their territory, this was a turning point for Prigozhin and may give us the first hints of him testing open rebellion. He became one of the only people in Russia to publicly break the Russian war censorship laws by criticizing the Russian Ministry of Defense. He became an outspoken critic, saying that the Russian commanders were bastards that ought to be sent to the front line barefoot with just a submachine gun. Then, in February 2023, he escalated his criticisms by accusing the Russian Ministry of Defense of refusing to send supplies and munitions to Wagner forces on purpose. They were deliberately starving Wagner forces of ammunition. A lot of people wonder how Putin didn't see this mutiny forming right under his nose, but he probably did. This is why they were trying to starve the Wagner group of supplies and force them to toe the line. But these attempts to control Prigozhin only led him to escalate. He made his first direct accusations against the Russian Ministry of Defense when he said the lack of ammo can be equated with high treason. On May 4th, 2023, Prigozhin made a video addressing Shoigu, yelling, Shoigu, where the f is the ammunition. The next day, he announced that since he wasn't getting ammo, he would pull his forces off the front line. 
He was threatening to collapse the front lines in their most important objective. He was essentially holding Bakhmut hostage from Putin. He was using all of his leverage. Prigozhin blamed Russian Defense Minister Sergei Shogu for the lack of supplies and for the death of tens of thousands of Wagner soldiers. He made statements that Shoigu was a fat cat sitting in his luxury offices. Wagner forces were then supposedly given the ammunition that they were calling for, and they were appeased for a moment. They stayed on the front lines long enough to capture the majority of the city of Bakhmut by May 20th, 2023. This earned Prigozhin the respect, power, love, and adoration of many people in Russia and in the Russian military. He was now seen as a national hero by many. However, by now, Wagner forces were exhausted from over a year of fighting, and they were being replaced by regular Russian conscripts and soldiers. Prigozhin sensed he was losing his leverage fast. The final straw came for Prigozhin on June 10th, when the Russian Ministry of Defense ordered all volunteer detachments to sign contracts with the proper Russian military by a deadline of July 1st. Like the lack of ammunition, this was a move authorized by Putin and it was designed to completely remove Prigozhin from his position of power, but he wanted to do it quietly. Other private military companies instantly fell in line and signed the contracts without dispute, but Prigozhin recorded a video publicly refusing to sign the contract. It would essentially mean the end of his power and influence if he did. It would be the end of Wagner. All his mercenaries would be dissolved into the Russian military. Unconfirmed reports indicate the Russian government was actually getting ready to arrest Prigozhin for this continued insubordination. He saw this as an existential threat against him. According to the US intelligence networks, they saw signs of Prigozhin preparing and stockpiling equipment and materials for the rebellion at this point, weeks prior to the launch. If Prigozhin was going to act, it would have to be now. So on the night of June 23rd, at 2100 hours, Prigozhin posted video footage claiming to be evidence of a Wagner camp being struck deliberately by Russian forces, killing dozens of his men. This might have been a false flag attack though, a fake attack designed to justify the armed rebellion that would follow. Then, Prigozhin released a series of angry statements on Telegram that were aimed at every regular rank and file Russian soldier. He requested that they join him in what he called his march of justice against the incompetent Russian military leadership in the Ministry of Defense that he claimed had misled President Putin about a false pretense to get into the war in Ukraine. On June 24th, at 4.44 in the morning, he took between 8,500 and 4,000 of his most loyal mercenaries and up to 350 pieces of heavy equipment to take over the South Military District Command in Rostov. Prigozhin claimed to have 25,000 troops, but this was likely an exaggeration. He did have with him nine main battle tanks, some T-90s, four Tiger vehicles, a Grad MLRS system, a howitzer, and a Pantsir S-1 air defense system, and infantry fighting vehicles. If his plan was going to work, Prigozhin needed to leverage his social media influence to convince regular everyday Russian troops to join his revolt because he only had a small group of soldiers. He didn't have the manpower necessary on his own. The reason he didn't call this action a coup was twofold. First, because it would be harder for these Russian soldiers to swallow. They'd be less sympathetic to join a coup, which seemed like treason. But to revolt against the terrible Russian military leadership, that they might stomach. Second, not calling it a coup also gave him the wiggle room to cut a deal if his plan failed and he could say it was all just simply a protest. Let's look at what signals Prigozhin had in front of him at that moment that might indicate he could convince regular soldiers to join him. We know many Russian soldiers hadn't been paid and hadn't taken leave to go home in months. Instead of the $2,560 they were owed each month, Russian soldiers say they've been paid several times less that each paycheck. Some regular soldiers and conscripts had complained about not being paid in two months straight. There are two things you can't mess with when it comes to soldiers. Can't screw with their paycheck and you can't screw with their chow. Prigozhin also claimed Russian casualties were many times higher than reported by the Ministry of Defense. If soldiers feel their lives are being wasted away, they might be at a tipping point to revolt if they think they're gonna die on the front anyway. 
the Russian government started fighting back instantly. Former Russian commanders instantly created competing video messages addressing their troops, begging them to not follow Prigozhin and to not follow the Wagner units. They restricted internet access to reduce the effectiveness and reach of Prigozhin's messages. Russia's FSB opened up a criminal case against Prigozhin for inciting an armed rebellion. But by Saturday, June 24th, 6.59 in the morning, local time in Rostov, Prigozhin and his armed soldiers had already captured and surrounded the Southern Military District headquarters in Rostov, a city with a population of one million people. Prigozhin captured the deputy defense minister in Rostov and humiliated him during a forced meeting with him saying, our men die because you treat them like meat, no ammo, no plans. Prigozhin threatened him, saying that if he wasn't handed Shoigu, the geriatric clown, then he would take his soldiers and march on Moscow. Saturday, June 24th, around 10.38 a.m. in the morning, Putin made an address calling Prigozhin's campaign a criminal enterprise and an armed insurgency of betrayal and treason. Directly after Putin's address, the Wagner Telegram account wrote the following at 10.54. Putin made the wrong choice. So much worse for him. Soon we will have a new president. Wagner started heading straight up the M4 highway in Russia. Meanwhile, Russian units were busy reinforcing Moscow's defenses. Wagner was breezing past checkpoints at first. In fact, they were often greeted with Russian civilians who were cheering them on. But it's a long 16 hour drive from Rostov to Moscow, and this gave Putin's forces enough time to start tearing up the M4 highway and to send attack helicopters and planes against Prigozhin's forces. Wagner shot down two combat helicopters, four transport aircraft, and one plane during this time, killing at least 13 Russians. By 11 a.m. in the morning Moscow time, Wagner forces had made it past Voronezh in Russia, where police and National Guard units appeared to be laying down their arms and letting Wagner roll through. Prigozhin was hoping by the time he got to Moscow, he would be reinforced by thousands of rebellious, regular Russian soldiers. Airstrikes started to pummel the route to Moscow. This would be like if Blackwater marched on Philadelphia and held it hostage and any military base in the state until they were able to replace the United States Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin. But as Prigozhin got closer and closer to Moscow, the support he needed did not materialize in the vast numbers he required. He hoped support would snowball and pick up a life of its own by this point, but the signs were not pointing in his favor. Airstrikes in front of the convoy were setting him back. Prigozhin had overestimated his influence. By 1800 hours on June 24th, the Wagner convoy had split into three separate columns likely dispersed by Russian air power. Within 120 miles of Moscow, so close yet so far, his forces were likely starting to take casualties from Russian airstrikes and artillery, but Prigozhin did still have enough firepower to cause a horrible headache for Putin if he decided to continue to assault Moscow. He still had that leverage but he would have struggled to take the capital city in a prolonged fight. This is probably why both sides wanted to negotiate an end to this to avoid further embarrassment. Neither side was 100% confident in the outcome. I think all of this evidence presented so far suggests that this was a failed coup attempt by Prigozhin. He disguised it to look like a protest in case it didn't work out in his favor, and he could do that at the last possible minute. Once he got within 120 miles of Moscow and his forces were getting battered by Russian air power and additional units weren't showing up, he needed to cut a deal and pretend this wasn't a coup. The Chechenian leader of a mercenary group said his fighters were prepared to help put down the mutiny and they were likely on their way to intercept Prigozhin. It was not looking good and the walls were closing in. The official reports say Prigozhin negotiated with Belarus President Lukashenko to reach an agreement where he would be given a pardon and could go live in exile in Belarus. It probably wouldn't have looked good for Putin to kill eight to 4,000 Wagner mercenaries and lose thousands of his own men in the process right on the doorstep to the capital city. The reason Prigozhin had to negotiate with Lukashenko instead of Putin is because it would have been humiliating for Putin, a man of such great power as himself, to negotiate directly with a convict and former chef of his. This is a lose-lose for both men here. Prigozhin being exiled to Belarus is not the fate of someone who is victorious. At 2024 Moscow time, the night of June 24th, Prigozhin ordered his units to turn around and head back south to their training camps and the front lines in Ukraine. 
An acceptable deal had been reached, he claimed. Prigozhin was able to save face by saying he decided to turn back to avoid Russian bloodshed. He was seen driving out of Rostov in a black SUV. Fans and admirers were still cheering him on from the side of the road. But what had he really accomplished? It looks like he mainly saved his own skin. But it's tough to tell at this point. It didn't appear like Russian military leadership would be changed. Sergei Shoigu would still stay in power, it seemed like, which is what he claimed he wanted to change all along. Although that is still subject to change. It didn't appear like he would retain control of Wagner forces, another thing that he said he wanted. The British security forces told the Telegraph that they believed Russian intelligence services had likely threatened to harm the families of Wagner commanders inside of Russia, who agreed to participate in a mutiny. It's possible that this is one of the reasons or theories as to why Prigozhin called off the capture of Moscow. In the aftermath of the failed rebellion, on June 26, Sergei Shogu was seen on video with Russian troops, which appeared to suggest by the Russian government government that he was not thrown out of power as part of the deal cut with Prigozhin. Questions remain. Could Prigozhin really go live in peace next door in Belarus for the remainder of his life after he was disloyal to Putin? On June 26, Prigozhin released an audio communication claiming that he wasn't actually trying to overthrow the government, and he turned around after his protest was completed. He was really walking back his coup. Notably, he admitted his forces regrettably had to shoot down Russian helicopters. Putin released a statement that he would have been able to crush the rebellion whether they had turned back or not. On June 27th, flight data belonging to the Wagner private plane was seen flying from Rostov to Belarus, a possible hint that he had gone into exile. But Putin is known for having his opponents killed for far less. This was the greatest threat to his power in two decades. There are many hardliners now in Russia who are pissed off that Prigozhin and Wagner essentially get away without even a slap on the wrist after they murked over a dozen Russian airmen. The agreement stated all Wagner forces would pull back and that Wagner, who didn't join the rebellion, would sign contracts with the Russian military of defense and be absorbed into their forces. The ones that did do the mutiny were given a pardon and would face no backlash for the rebellion, even though they had allegedly killed over a dozen Russian pilots. At this point, this is still a developing story, and any of this is subject to change. Will Wagner forces peacefully assimilate into Russian army units? We don't know. They could be mistreated and sent to punishment brigades that are used as just human wave assaults to punish them for their part in the mutiny. Prigozhin, a 62-year-old former chef of Putin, who grew up on the same St. Petersburg streets, was a petty criminal turned multi-millionaire businessman. His influence was created by Putin and the Kremlin. He then started a failed armed rebellion against at least the Russian Ministry of Defense, and if things had manifested differently, probably against the entire Russian government itself. But what do you think in the comments section? Was this a coup d'etat, or a rebellion, or a mutiny? Or are you one of the people who believes this whole thing was some kind of conspiracy cooked up between Putin and Prigozhin? If you found some part of the video valuable, please consider hitting the like button, and check out this video if you have a minute, I think you'll really like it.